Hi there everyone, welcome to this week's video where we're going to be discussing Kant and Fichte on the death penalty. These readings are really exciting for me because I think that Kant and Fichte, even though they both, as we discussed in the last video, tend to approach issues from a deontological perspective, end up parting ways in very interesting respects. So it's very informative for us as uh, students of uh, ethical theory and ethical thought to look at the differences between them because it might be illustrative at least somewhat about alternative possibilities for each ethical theory. So for example, uh, while Kant, for example, is a major figure for uh, deontological ethics and oftentimes he's the sole reference uh, for thinking about deontological ethics, it's actually quite interesting that you can be just as much a deontologist as Kant and reach totally contrary conclusions. Last week we talked about both of them and, uh, you know, we could say both of them on lying or both of them on the importance of circumstance. And today we're going to analyze them both on the topic of the death penalty. Kant and Fichte actually outline, I think, two of the major paradigms for theories of punishment that continue to uh, exist and thrive today, for better or for worse. So it'll definitely be worth of our time as students of ethical theory to look through each of their thoughts on the issue and examine the fundamental differences between them so that we can clarify our own thinking about ethics and of course our own thinking about the death penalty. I would like to also know that there are lots of ethical considerations that are at play when you're thinking about the death penalty. It's not only abstract philosophical concerns like the kind that Kant and Fichte are going to be uh, uh, concerned with here. There are also more practical ways that we can ask about, you know, uh, the humanity, the humaneness of various, uh, you know, methods of putting someone to death as well as the role that the death penalty might play in a particular kind of society. These are all relevant aspects for thinking about, you know, what we should think about the death penalty in the times that we live in. But as we are philosophers, our primary concern is always going to be the sort of normative fundamental question that's at the background of those considerations, which is like, can the state ever put someone to death for any kind of crime? Is that ever right? Or is it always wrong? So let's begin. To begin with, we're going to have Kant, of course, here uh, on the left side of the board. And Kant is notable in the history of philosophies of punishment for maintaining that the death penalty is absolutely mandatory. So in other words, it's not only the case that, you know, it's acceptable for the state to utilize the death penalty. Kant went even further in stating that if the state withheld from the death penalty on someone who, on his view, genuinely deserved the punishment, that they, in turn, would be doing a serious moral wrong. So in other words, the state has an obligation to resort to the death penalty for certain kinds of gravely serious crimes. Now, Kant's theory of punishment is often called a retributive theory of punishment. To reflect that, I've written up on the board here that the purpose of punishment is retribution. So, you know, retributive, retribution, those have the same root word, right? So in other words, what Kant thinks is the essential principle undergirding all uh, punishment, all rightful punishment, is retribution. So the idea is just that when someone commits a wrong, that 
Uh, the purpose of punishment is to meet them with a greater wrong, to discourage members of society from breaking the law, and to, I don't know, affirm our steadfastness and our belief of, you know, these kinds of principles. So, Kant thought that when someone does a moral wrong, like murder, and then is given the death penalty, that in a way, this almost kind of like cancels out the original crime. And ultimately, Kant's case for the death penalty is going to come from the claim that it's out of respect, not even for the victim, but for the perpetrator, which is a kind of wild, um, you know, uh, uh, idea. I'm giving you the death penalty for your sake, right? That's, that's Kant's uh, idea in the background here. So what's at stake here? Well, remember that the first formulation of the categorical imperative, the formula of universal law, says that we should imagine uh, what it would be like if the, uh, the maxim underlying our action became a universal law of nature. So in other words, Kant in a way says that what morality is about is recognizing that when you commit some kind of action that you're justifying it not only for yourself but also for other people. So the murderer, for example, uh, maybe upholds the principle or the maxim that it's acceptable to kill if it's in his self-interest, right? Kant's idea is the way that we're respecting the maxim of the perpetrator is we're treating that guy like a rational agent, that murderer guy, right? And in doing so, we are recognizing the choice that the murderer made, right? Um, they wanted to affirm the existence of a world that would eliminate people if they became inconvenient. They are now inconvenient, and so the state, you know, uh, can get rid of them, right? From the same principle that the murderer, uh, I've been using ge he gender pronouns, so he uh, 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 decided, right? And so this is the sense that Kant maintains that punishment, even retributive punishment, like the death penalty, comes out of a place of respect for the rational agent of, or agency of the perpetrator. So Kant's idea is that when wrongdoers commit injustice, they are intentionally severing themselves from morality and from their moral status. <clears throat> and as we discussed on the previous Peter Sinker week, rationality is the most important marker of morality for Kant and also the deontological approach quite generally. Kant thinks the criminals have violated these rules for rational agency, which is just morality. And so uh, they have in a way severed themselves from the moral consideration that we would, um, you know, uh, otherwise have to uh, show them. One thing you might notice about Kant's account is that there's nothing in the way of thinking about the circumstances of the perpetrator. In other words, Kant thinks it's wrong to treat the perpetrator like they're just like a thing and that you can like just mold them however that you want them to be. Kant, in a way, defends his whole position by saying that retributive punishment is actually respect for the perpetrator. So when someone commits an injustice, they're severing themselves from moral consideration. And in a way, conscious thinks that when a state doles out punishment, it's just following through on the thing that, uh, you know, the criminal or wrongdoer is already affirmed. So that's Kant's theory of retributive punishment. It's one of the uh, only attempts to really explain how it is that punishing someone can, in a way, make you equal with them, right? You're canceling out the wrongdoing in some significant respect. 
But now let's examine the alternative perspective, the one today uh, outlined by Fichte. Fichte held, in his view, is a little paradoxical, it's a little strange, but I think that we can get a handle on it. Fichte thought that the death penalty is never justified. So Fichte thought uh, that the state could, for example, wage war or even uh, engage in military affairs of self-defense and so on. These aren't the death penalty. But that the state can never um, put someone who has moral and political consideration to death. So Fichte actually thought that there's no case, it doesn't matter how violent, how horrible the ver perpetrator is, or how horrible their injustices are, our commitment to morality prevents us from allowing the state to put anyone to death, right? And so Fichte thinks that the purpose of punishment is not retribution. I mean, Fichte might ask something like, well, okay, you say it like cancels out the original crime, but does it? I mean, it just kind of seems like more people are dead. It doesn't seem like there's any sort of cosmic equality or something like that um, that is only uh, produced by uh, extreme forms of punishment, right? To the contrary, Fichte thought that morality actually dictated that you think about the purpose of punishment as rehabilitation. In other words, we have this duty because we have a duty to humanity. Just as a brief kind of note, Fichte is interesting because he's a lot more of a granular thinker than Kant. And what I mean by that is that Fichte was willing to recognize that we are not fully rational, but we're not fully irrational either, right? In other words, rationality comes at a certain kind of scale, right? We have like no rationality, say that we're when we're a toddler. We have very little rationality when we're a young child. We get more rationality as a teenager, and so on. And moreover, this is true not only developmentally, but also, uh, you know, just kind of on a daily basis, right? I mean, I'm asleep for eight hours of the day, right? So I'm not a very rational creature then. And moreover, you know, people do things like get drunk or what have you, right? And in doing so, they're becoming less rational than they were before. So... Unlike Kant, who tended to think about rationality and reason as a sort of binary way, you have it and you matter, or you don't and you don't, Fichte instead thought about our ability to act as rational creatures in the world as kind of conditioned. That there are certain kinds of circumstances where we can be like perfectly rational, but there are all sorts of circumstances where we can't for various reasons. And sometimes one of these things that overcomes you and makes you act rationally can make you do really uh, morally reprehensible things. But it's not necessarily reflective of that agent's decision that they committed this crime. I mean, just think about, uh, for example, schizophrenic people, people with severe mental illnesses, right? When they commit wrongdoing, it's not an intentional wrongdoing. Right? And so we can't attribute agency to the perpetrator in the manner that Kant does. Instead, Fichte's kind of main idea, I think, is just that you can never write anybody off, right? What do I mean by that? Well, we have to think that no matter how irrationally someone has acted in the past, that it's at least possible for them uh, to act rationally again in the future. So, for example, if you're um, someone who uh, is in the unfortunate situation of having someone close to you that you love be addicted to drugs or something like that, right? You always hope that they get better, right? Even if, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of good reason to think so. Fichte's thought, and he thinks that you actually have to extend this to all of humanity. Uh, he himself 
uh, was like racist and sexist, right? So he didn't really follow through this idea so great. But nonetheless, his idea, <laughs> at least, right, is that you have to think about everyone is equally capable of being rational. So you always have to keep in hope for other people. And so if you can't write people off, then that means that you have to always accept the possibility that someone who even commits serious extreme wrongdoing can come to see, um, you know, um, the error of their ways, as it were. Part of Fichte's thought is based on this idea of social contract theory. If you haven't heard of this before, it's a sort of like ethical political theory that was highly influential in the period that we're discussing and we're sort of at the roots of the American and French Revolution. The general idea was this. It said, or maybe we can say social contract theory asks, when is the use of political power legitimate? Before social contract theory, it was just believed that, well, you know, powers used by the state are legitimate because uh, ultimately they were ordained by God, right? And so you have this kind of theological, mythological uh, telling of, uh, a, you know, a story about political legitimacy. Social contract theory says, well, no, actually our obligations towards the state aren't based on like God or something divine or something like that, right? Instead, we can think about our relationship to the state as if it were like a contract where I say to the state, okay, you know, if you protect me and my property, then I will do things like pay taxes and serve jury duty and, you know, do all sorts of things like that, all of my obligations uh, towards the state. Now, a critical aspect of social contract theory, and part of the reason why I mentioned it was so influential for various revolutions during this period, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, right, is that social contract theory then states, well, if the state is failing on its obligations to you, then you don't have any obligations towards the state. So in the French Revolution, for example, people believed that the state had failed on their end of the social contract. And so they were justified in committing uh, massive amounts of political violence against uh, the state and also against the aristocratic classes that controlled the state. So part of Fichte's thought for why the state can never put someone to death is because the state is only acting legitimately when it's acting within the social contract. But you can't have a contract that involves putting someone to death, right? So in other words, uh, the state could never expect someone to agree to a contract where uh, they die at the end of it, right? And so the most the state can do is renege on their end of the contract as well. So Fichte says that the state can essentially exile you. It can say that it has no obligations towards you anymore. It can fail to protect you or to, uh, you know, help you any further. But the state cannot put any person, any moral agent to death. We're going to end with a kind of final paradox uh, surrounding Kant and Fichte on the death penalty. You might think that where you come down on the death penalty just really depends on what you think about political violence. If you think political violence is good, then, you know, you might be okay with the state putting people down. If you think political violence is bad, well, then you might not want the state to engage in the death penalty, and you might be on Fichte's side. But at least for Kant, and at least for Fichte, things don't quite work that way. Why do I say that? Well, um, ultimately, 
Kant and Fichte both got to write at the time of the French Revolution. So they got to witness, uh, you know, this sort of opening acts and for Fichte, the whole thing of the French Revolution into aftermath. And so they had opinions about it, right? Fichte was notably pro-violent revolution, right? So even though he says no death penalty, He's very, very pro-French Revolution, right? Why is he pro-French Revolution? Well, because what happened in the French Revolution is the state failed on the social contract. So the people are essentially justified in replacing the state. By contrast, Kant looked at the French Revolution with horror. You know, he saw these people being beheaded, right? Uh, he, he was fearful that the same thing would happen to his own homeland, right? And so he was very anti-French Revolution. So it's just interesting how that works, that they're sort of flip-flopped on this. And it's clear that ultimately the issue isn't, doesn't turn on political violence at all. I hope that you found this video interesting. I've loved talking it through with you all, and I very much look forward to hearing what you think. I'll see you in the next one.